Today we celebrate the solemnity of Jesus Christ the King. Jesus Christ, King of the Universe. That's the official title of the feast for today. And it's always celebrated on the very last Sunday of ordinary time, meaning what it is is so how the liturgical year works, um, it, it doesn't follow our it doesn't start on New Year's and end on December 31st. For the liturgical year, it starts with the first Sunday of Advent, which will be next week, um, starting with, with celebrating Christmas, Christ coming into the world. You can see why that would be a good beginning, right? So it starts with that, and it ends with this, the Feast of Christ the King. Today, so we're celebrating the last Sunday of ordinary time, the last Sunday of the liturgical year. And kind of the idea behind it um, part of the, the imagery and the symbolism is as we go through the year, um, you know, in the, in the spring, the spring is the time for planting things, the summer is the time that they grow, and the fall is the time where we reap the harvest, where we see what fruits have been produced. That's part of why it's kind of fitting this time that in a spiritual way, that's what we start looking to. And that's why our readings start focusing on the last things, right? The end of time. We get those, the judgment and, and those type of readings during this time of year because we're supposed to be thinking, okay, what uh, spiritual fruits has my life produced? Much like as we're harvesting, you know, from our fields and whatnot. So that's why we get these themes and these readings that we've had the last couple of weeks. But then it kind of climaxes today with, with, the reading, the feast of Jesus Christ as king, because it recognizes that at the end of the liturgical year, it's meant to symbolize what? The end of time, the end of the age, when Christ returns as king. He returns as king, and he sits down on his throne, and he judges the nations, sheep and goats, right? Depending on what the fruits of their lives have shown. Christ is king. He came as king at Christmas time. He lived as king, he's preached the kingdom of God, and at the end of time he will come again to reign definitively. Jesus Christ is king. That phrase was a phrase um, in that idea that Christ is the king, was an idea that, that riveted the early Christians and has riveted Catholicism and Christianity ever since. It's not a... Uh, a, a um, it's not a neutral idea that Jesus is king. Why not? Why not? Because to claim that Christ is king, or the very common phrase that we see in the New Testament, that Jesus is Lord, it's the same idea. What it's saying is that Jesus Christ is the ultimate authority. No other authority, whether on heaven or on earth, is equal to him. No other authority is above him which means we, ought to, we need to follow Christ in everything. Nothing supplants him, nothing takes his place. And part of the reason why this has gotten Catholics and Christians into trouble up and down the ages is because authorities and earthly authorities tend to not like that idea, do they? <laughs> um, the, part of the phrase, why they would say Jesus is Lord, it came from the Greek, it would say... Um, Jesus Curios, Jesus is Lord. What that was, was it was a playoff of a phrase that was meant to be attributed to Caesar. Kaiser Curios, Kaiser is Lord, Caesar is Lord. That's what the Romans would say, Caesar's Lord, Caesar's Lord. No one else, you know, is as high as Caesar. And the Christians come along and are saying, no, you know, we'll listen to Caesar, we'll be good citizens, we'll follow the laws, but Jesus is Lord. Caesar is below Jesus. Jesus is king. And because of this, um, the Roman Empire did not look too favorably <laughs> upon Christians, as we know from our history. And as we also know from our history, though, it didn't stop with Rome. This has been an issue up and down the centuries. Sometimes we've had great times of prosperity and peace in Christendom, and sometimes, as we've seen, uh, governments and nations and cultures have responded very um, violently against Christendom. Just to point, uh, kind of as a modern example, you could go back just a hundred years and see the Cristero movement in um, Mexico, 
for those of you who want kind of a good, fun movie that, that describes this, if you've ever seen For Greater Glory, which stars, I think, uh, Andy Garcia and Eva Longoria, um, kind of shows what happened during this movement historically. And what it was, was the atheistic, fascist government of Mexico decided to put the clamp down on Catholicism. And so there was a revolt and a rebellion by, um, by the Catholics who wanted to practice religious freedom and wanted to practice their faith. But the phrase, the motto, and the battle cry that was used by the Catholics in the Cristero movement, you know, it wasn't just like religious freedom. The phrase was uh, Viva Cristo Rey, which means long live Christ the King. Christ is King. Because what they recognized is that their fascist, atheistic government was not king. Christ was king. And they were willing to die for that fact, and many did. We could fast forward even to more recent times and see governments and societies who refuse, not just refuse to acknowledge that Christ is king, but refuse to let their citizens live their lives as if Christ is actually king. We see thus with, you know, the, the fascist, atheist Nazis in the, in World War II, but also through communist atheism and totalitarianism, which is very present even in our own time with communist China. Why? Because the government, the state, wants to be, have ultimate authority. And so to claim that Jesus is Lord and that Christ is King, for the same reason Rome doesn't like that, these states do not like that as well. But there's another ideology that also practices that belief. It's an ideology that is just as dangerous as the fascist movement in uh, Nazi Germany or in Mexico, or the communist movement that we still see in China, in the atheist movement. And that ideology is secularism. And we see it run rampant throughout our world and society now. And part of the reason why secularism is so, in a sense, even more dangerous than these other ones is because secularism has a wonderful way of getting Christians to act as if Christ isn't king while still thinking that they're good Christians. How does it do this? Because what secularism claims and what it pushes and what it, what it enforces um, without question is that religion is all well and good but you should keep it a private affair. Religion and Jesus are good things if, if that floats your boat, but do not bring that into the public square. The public square and where everyone else operates and ideas are exchanged, that is the place for politics, and politics is the ultimate authority, not religion. That's what the ideology says. And part of the reason it's so dangerous is because if we're as Catholics, we accept that and believe it, we can think we're being good Catholics, but really, Christ is no longer king. Christ is, you know, the guy, um, <laughs> the guy who's shut up in the closet. Christ is kept in the privacy of our own thoughts and of our own homes and of our own hearts, but he's not reigning in the exchange of ideas or in the public square. And if you don't think that this ideology has a grip on the world, then simply look at the events of this past year. Simply look at the events of this past year. Now, as I talk about these, I'm going to talk a little bit about the pandemic and the coronavirus. When I talk about this, please do not mistake me. I am not trying to make a claim on whether to take it seriously or not to take it seriously, whether to respond in this way or in that way. That is a discussion for a different time, and that's not something I want to talk about. But what is clear to anyone who has two eyes isn't is that in whatever responses we have had to the coronavirus, there is a double standard when it comes to practice of faith. And that is a big problem. How is it that in the eight months of the coronavirus, <laughs> how is it that in San Francisco you're allowed to go to uh, bars and strip clubs, but the cathedral for Catholics, that seats over 2,000 people can only seat one member at a time praying or you're breaking the law. And how does that make any sort of sense? <laughs> it doesn't, right? How come we had um, protests 
and I'm not getting into it what one way or the other, what side you come down on, but we had protests that were against racism and against police brutality, and through the actions of certain individuals or organizations, how can we saw all across the country how quickly some of those things turned into an excuse to decapitate statues of saints like St. Juniper Osera and statues of the Sacred Heart and statues of the Blessed Mother, decapitate them, cover them in red paint, and spray swastikas on the side of church buildings. How does that in any way relate to police brutality or racism? It doesn't. It's an excuse for the powers of this age to try to shut down the gospel and to try to claim that Christ is not king. That's what's going on, and it needs to be called out, and it needs to end and to stop. One of the reasons, the reason I'm so fired up, one of the reasons I'm so fired up about this, if you want to know <laughs> why I decided to preach on this today, is um, to bring it a little close to home. Last Sunday, last Sunday I had the Masses. I had Harrietsville, and then I had the noon Mass here, and I finished Mass and I walked over to the rectory and I got out of my clerics, you know, put my sweatpants on, got my bag of chips and was turning on some football and I was about to relax and like 30 seconds later the phone rang. <laughs> and I was like, yay, this is, this is wonderful. Um, and so I picked it up, of course. And I picked it up and said hello. And the person on the phone, it was a woman who, um, I didn't know her, I believe she lived out of state. Um, but what she was, she was um, upset. In fact, she was crying on the phone. And what she was, and she was distressed because her father was in the hospital in Marietta Memorial, right here. And he was in the hospital. And he was 85 years old, and he had double pneumonia, um, and it wasn't looking good. And so that's why she was, you know, upset. And so she asked me if I would please go and give him last rites. And I said, of course, I'll do that. So, you know, got my clerics, drove down there, and he was in the emergency room. And when I showed up, um, long story short, I was told I could not uh, visit the man and anoint him because the hospital policy was that uh, only one visitor per person per day, and the man has already had his visitor, so his priest cannot come and anoint him. Needless to say, I was not happy. <laughs> um, well, I realized after a bit of conversation that I wasn't getting anywhere, and so I, I asked, okay, well then how about if I come back tomorrow morning and I can be the one visitor for the guy um, and give him the sacraments? To which the nurse replied, well, in, in a nicer way, but essentially what she said was, there's really no need because he'll be dead by then. I was very not happy. <laughs> um, now, fortunately, through the grace of God, what did happen is I did go back the next day, and he had survived through the night and was moved out of the ER, so I was able to visit him and anoint him, and now he is with Jesus and our blessed Lord, sent on his way with the sacraments. Praise God. However, that might not have been the case. And what I want to bring this up is that I'm not trying to start a fight over whether to take the coronavirus seriously or not or anything like that. That's, just, that's a discussion for another place. What I am saying is that as Catholics and as people of faith, we need to have our eyes open to a double standard in the response. It's not, it makes no sense that we can go to restaurants and bars or even strip clubs, that we can exercise or we can go to sport games, and yet a priest can't hear a dying man's confession. That makes no sense whatsoever. And what it is, is it's diabolical. And it's a direct attack on Christ as king. Keep your faith in your own personal house, but don't bring it out to our hospital. Keep your faith in your own personal house, but don't bring it out to the public square. Another thing that's happening, now this not, isn't in our own country, but in France right now, is what they decided to do is they've, um, they've suppressed all public masses. Uh, so you, can't, you can go pray in a church, but you can't go in the church if, mass, if there's mass. Uh, how that makes sense, I don't know. But what you are allowed to do is you're allowed to attend political protests. You're allowed to attend political protests if they're approved by the police. 
But if you go, so what what's happened is a number of Catholics in France right now, in Paris, and in a no, number of places, they're protesting. They're protesting that the government allowed the churches um, to be open or allowed them to celebrate Mass. But then what the government said was, okay, you're allowed to protest, but you're not allowed to pray at the protest. You can be there, but you can't say any prayers there because that's not a separation of church and state. And what happened was, as soon as the Catholics knelt down on the ground, the police were sent in. This is what's happening right now, and it makes absolutely no rational sense unless you understand the ideology behind it of secularism that says your faith cannot be put in the public square. Then it makes sense. Then decapitations of statues make sense because statues have no business in public if the faith's only place is in the privacy of our own homes. As Catholics, we cannot stand for this. As Catholics, we must speak out against this. So, what do we do? What do we do? Two things. I think there's two things that we do. The first is that uh, following the example of the saints of the past, following the example of the scriptures, we first pray. And we pray that the Lord will deliver us, that the Lord will bring justice, that the Lord will throw down the wicked who are seeking, who are anti-gospel, anti-church, and anti-Christ, that the Lord will throw them down, that truth will prevail and justice will prevail. We pray that the Lord will deliver us as he delivered Israel under Esther, as he delivered the people of Israel when Pharaoh was going to wipe them out next to the Red Sea, as he delivered Daniel from the lion's den, so too he can deliver us no matter how the powers of the world are arranged against the church. It doesn't matter because Christ is king and he is stronger. And the second thing that we can do is keep our eyes open and in our own lives don't live the double standard. A really good example of this is if I have found in my own life now how you want to respond and take precautions against the coronavirus, I advise you to, you know, uh, weigh that and discern that. But my point is don't take precautions in a way that's a double standard with your faith. If, in taking precautions against the coronavirus, you have deemed it too dangerous to come to church, but you go out to the restaurant, then what you're doing is you're saying beer is more important than the Eucharist. If you think it's okay to work out, if you're going out to sports games, then what you're saying is that is worth the risk, but the Eucharist is not. Don't live that standard. Because if you do, you don't have to answer to me. You can answer to the one who separates the sheep from the goats. Because the king will ask you why one day. He will. So keep that in your mind. We can't live the double standard in our lives. You know, if if it's, if it's okay, if it's worth the risk to attend a political protest or a political rally, whether on the left or on the right, it makes no difference, but it's not worth the risk to come to Mass, then we've really got our priorities mixed up. Because what that's saying is that our politics is on the throne and that's king, but the Eucharist in Jesus is not. Wherever he lines up, he's not the ultimate authority. And as Catholics, we can't stand for that. We can't live that double standard because this is also what it leads to. I'm going to, close, I'm going to close just briefly with this. Let's remember that one of the things Christ mentioned in our gospel was you were ill and you did not care for me. You were sick and you did not care for me. Why? Because whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Last Sunday, that 85-year-old man wasn't just the only one who was laying in the hospital being refused to be ministered to. Jesus Christ himself was. And we cannot stand for it as Catholics. God bless you.